All right, welcome back to part three. Just before we are cut off at the end of part two, we were talking about the quantities that are still unknown in this system. The only two quantities we don't know are the angular acceleration and the linear acceleration. And we were saying that there's a relationship between those two that the acceleration is equal to the angular acceleration times the radius. We can reason our way through this just to make sure it makes sense by looking at what's happening. As the inner radius is rotating counterclockwise, it's pulling up a length of cord equal to the sector, or the arc length of the radius as it turns, which is related to the angular displacements, related to the angular acceleration. So as long as the cord doesn't slip, the acceleration of the box is going to be related by this equation to the angular acceleration of the pulley. And because we're wrapping along the inside pulley axis, we should be using R1, which is our 0.2 meter value. So if we make those two substitutions, the substitution for the tension, and the substitution for the acceleration will get an equation that looks like this. If I use a pen. We have the force times the radius outside minus the uh, mass. So this is the tension term right here. Mass times gravity plus angular acceleration times the inner radius. There I made the substitution for the uh, acceleration and angular acceleration. And that's equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. So in this case we only have one unknown, the angular acceleration. And that was one of the things they asked for. We want to find the angular acceleration and the tension. So um, after we, oh I've left out a term here. I need radius 1 here. You see I have tension times radius 1. So here in the square brackets was tension. You need to have radius 1 right there. So once I distribute through, I need to solve for the angular acceleration. So I'm going to do that by distributing the radius through and then dividing by the moment of inertia. And when I do that I'm going to get F R2 minus mass times gravity times R1 minus uh, mass times the angular acceleration times R1 squared. And then I'm going to have equals the moment of inertia times the acceleration. At this point I can collect this term over to the other side and I can factor out the angular acceleration and I'll get this expression. The angular acceleration is equal to um, the force times the outside radius minus mass times gravity times the inside radius And um, that's all going to be divided by the moment of inertia plus mass times the inside radius squared. Right. If I plug in all of the values that were given to me, I should get 6.3 radians per second squared. Okay, That was one of the things they asked for. The other thing they asked for was for the tension and at this point we can just plug in this value. We can go up here to the equation we derived for the tension. We can include the mass of the crate. Gravity is 9.8 and the acceleration which is going to be 6.3 radians per second squared times the inner radius and that'll give me the tension. 
and I'll find that the tension is equal to 5 times 10 to the third newtons. Okay. Many of the problems that you'll have for homework tomorrow night will rely on concepts that you've seen in the last three examples. The next thing that I want to do is I want to give you a little bit of a hint or a head start on the homework that's due tonight. Um, it can be a little bit tricky, but as long as you think your way through it carefully, um, you'll find that it's not too bad. All right, so let's look at this problem from the homework. So the problem for the homework tonight is 24, which is down here. And let's see, 24. This is a very common problem to be asked in a physics class, especially a freshman college physics class. Um, we have a bike wheel that has some radius, and we're going to pull it horizontally from the center axis. We're going to pull with some force, and we need the wheel to roll up and over a small step of height h. So again, you can we can read this here. The drawing shows a bicycle wheel resting against a small step whose height is h. The weight and radius of the wheel are given, and a horizontal force F is applied to the axle of the wheel. As the magnitude of F increases, there comes a time when the wheel just begins to rise up and lose contact with the ground. What is the magnitude of the force when this happens? So this can seem like a very complicated problem at first, and what we need to do is we need to draw a diagram and try to figure out exactly what torques and forces are acting on that bicycle wheel. So let's go ahead and do that. So we've got the bike wheel and a step. So let me draw. Here's our wheel. And here's our ground, horizontal ground, step. Actually, let me draw that a little bit. There we go. All right. And the center of the wheel is here. If we imagine pulling this wheel, so we're going to pull from the center. So there's going to be a force exerted horizontally pulling from the center of the wheel. If we imagine what will happen, eventually the wheel will lift off the ground and it will only be in contact with one point. And the point of contact will be the edge of this step there. We should consider this our pivot point because that's where the wheel will actually pivot around. And so if we, if we do consider that the pivot point, we know the moment arm is going to be the center of the wheel down to the pivot point. That'll be R. And we have a couple of different forces that are going to be exerting torques. Force F is exerting a torque, but it's not exerting a torque over the radius r, it's exerting a torque over the component of the radius that is perpendicular to it. And there's another force acting on the uh, bike wheel, which is its weight. And as long as the bike wheel is uniform in its mass distribution, the weight will pull from the center of the axis. So this is the weight of the wheel pulling downward and that's going to provide another torque. And again, this torque is not acting over a moment arm of R. We need to consider the component of the moment arm that's perpendicular so that's going to be here. We know that the height of the step has is a height h. So from here to here is h. And from the center of the wheel down to the ground is a height r. 
because that's the radius of the wheel. And the distance from the center of the wheel to the step is also the radius r because that's the radius of the wheel. We're going from the center to the edge of the wheel. So we can use a little bit of trig to determine the magnitudes of the components that we need to determine the torques. If we look at the force vector, it's going to be providing a torque that would cause the wheel to rotate in this direction. And we can call that positive if we want. If we look at the weight, the weight is going to be providing a torque that is rotating in the negative direction. So they'll counteract each other. What we're interested in is a situation where, as they say in the book, the wheel is just about to leave the ground, which means that there is no normal force acting on the wheel helping support it. So there is no other torque. If it's just about to lift off the ground, the only forces acting and providing torque are the force that you're pulling with and the weight. And you might say, well, wait a second, there's another force. There's the force from the step acting on the wheel. But if you remember, we picked our pivot point to be the step, so it won't provide any torque. And so we can ignore that for now if we're just interested in finding the pulling force, because we know that the pulling force needs to be exactly counteracted with the weight of the wheel. So from there you should be able to solve that.